We're really excited to have Amir Siraj here. He is studying astrophysics at Harvard University, and he is also a classical pianist who is pursuing a master's degree at the New England Conservatory of Music. So we're so stoked to have you, Amir. Um, one of the reasons that we really wanted to talk to you is this amazing twin focus that you have, uh, doing both astrophysics and music. I have two older sisters, and. I had always uh, been sort of enthralled by the music they were making. I grew up in a uh, very small apartment and uh, we had a little spinet in the kitchen. And so I would always hop up there and um, play some notes. I started taking piano lessons formally at the age of four. And since then, it's really been a constant in my life. A sort of creative output, um, but also you know, a, a place where I go to think really about anything. You've co-authored numerous papers that are really taking on these mind-boggling concepts. And one of the ones that we wanted to talk about the most is um, this idea of life not being contained to one world. There's um, uh, a theory known as panspermia that, uh, you know, basically exchange between planetary bodies could potentially cause life as well to be exchanged. The conventional idea of panspermia is that when you have a large impact on the planetary body, some of the debris can get accelerated uh, to speeds that exceed the escape velocity of that planetary body. Um, and as a result, they can um, leave and um, perhaps end up elsewhere on another planet. So the origins of life on Earth are extremely mysterious and a major subject of study, but uh, there is one theory that um, kind of brings in the fact that Mars is thought to have been habitable about four billion years ago, around the same time that Earth was uh, first developing life. Um, so people wonder if maybe life developed first on Mars before it became pretty much inhospitable as it is now. Um, and, you know, uh, an impact might have uh, brought one of the rocks from Mars over to Earth and that could have seeded life here. Yeah, I think it's a it's a very um, interesting theory. And the reason why is, is because we know that, you know, exchange between the Earth and Mars uh, does exist. We, we see Martian meteorites and, and um, there is, you know, absolutely reason for us to think that if there was uh, biology on Mars at some point, um, that it could have been brought to Earth. And, you know, it's it's very difficult to ascertain the origins of life on Earth, as you mentioned, but um, but the idea that, you know, it could have come from Mars is uh, far from, you know, a, a wild one. I kind of, I'm kind of pulling for that theory myself. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so could you get into a little bit more on a solar system level, how that kind of might work, how... how uh, rocks from one planet end up on the other. There is such sound physical evidence for the exchange of rocks between Mars and the Earth. Um, this is something we really need to take quite seriously, uh, you know, especially given the search for life on Mars. If we do find life on Mars and it does resemble, um, you know, Earth life in terms of RNA and DNA, um, it'll be a very difficult question to answer whether this, it was a second genesis or whether it was the same. It might even be an impossible question to answer uh, because of the vast amount of exchange that nature has built in between these two rocky planets. It's wild enough to imagine that, right, within our solar system. But uh, you and your co-author, uh, Avi Loeb, uh, have proposed that perhaps interstellar um, panspermia could happen. So could you describe how that's different from having a regular impact? It, it seems like it would be much more of an earth grazing kind of effect in order to get that kind of speed going. This sort of line of thinking brought me to a totally different sort of avenue for panspermia, which is um, exactly as you said, sort of grazing objects that, you know, come close to the earth uh, they don't hit the earth, but they sort of graze the atmosphere and scoop up these sort of microbial hitchhikers um, that are then able to um, leave the solar system. We know that um, life exists in the atmosphere, um, but the, the sort of state of research is, um, is very much in its early days. And 
understanding uh, the abundance and the different types of uh, microbes that reside um, in the air can sort of tell us about you know how many microbial uh, <laughs> hitchhikers or how many of these um, sort of life-filled um, rocks have uh, exited the solar system in the past. It's uh, pretty amazing to think about. I mean, let's say uh, best case scenario in terms of just being an awesome idea. One of these uh, earth grazers comes by and picks up some microbes. How difficult do you think it would be um, for them to survive an interstellar journey? There's certainly a lot of extremophiles on earth. Um, could a microbe actually get to another star system? That is one of the most important questions here. And um, thankfully there was a uh, very small uh, rock that was discovered a couple of years ago um, to have grazed the Earth's atmosphere. And this gave us a very good calibration uh, for the number of small rocks, um, or at least gave us an order of magnitude sense for the number of small rocks that uh, grazed the Earth atmosphere as a function of time. And so that was a very encouraging um, detection. So say one of these comets or an interstellar object or uh, comes by Earth, grazes the atmosphere, how long would it possibly take to get to another star system? And, um, you know, you mentioned the likelihood. Could it just end up in space <laughs> traveling forever? Most of these objects are going to end up uh, nowhere. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> they, will, they will pass by lots of stars, but unfortunately not get close enough to any of them to get captured. Uh, but a select few will... Uh, pass by a star, usually on a time scale of millions of years. I mean, could be longer, but after, after millions of years, the likelihood um, that any bacteria would, or any microbe would still be alive is uh, quite minimal. Um, so if, uh, if you get lucky, you pass uh, close enough to a binary system that is moving at a slow enough speed relative to you to have a large capture cross section. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and you know, we've we've kind of been speaking about this in uh, terms of our life uh, going out into the rest of the Milky Way. Um, but we're so lucky in the last couple of years, and you've written a lot of papers about this, uh, that we're having we're beginning to get interstellar objects in our own solar system. So we do know it happens. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to this kind of wild idea of, uh, you know getting a sample of one of those um, interstellar uh, asteroids a, as a meteorite or something like that, or as a targeted mission, uh, what would we be looking for if we had the chance to finally get an in a piece of interstellar material, something from another star system? Interstellar objects are really, um, really one of the most exciting sort of developments in, in planetary science. And the reason is that usually uh, the best we can do in, in terms of um, studying and understanding uh, what other solar systems are like is, is by looking at them with a telescope. But at the end of the day, if we wanted a physical sample from one of these um, planetary systems other than our own, we would have to send a probe, uh, send a rocket, and using conventional technology that would, that would take hundreds of thousands of years even for nearby stars. And so that's quite a disappointing thought because there's so much that we can learn from, you know, actually studying a physical sample. Um, and then interstellar objects came along and, um, you know, first with Oumuamua and, and then with Borisov and they both had, you know, really uh, different properties, which is fascinating in its own right. And with the Vera Rubin Observatory um, expected to be coming online uh, next year, we expect you know, many, many more interstellar objects uh, to be discovered. And when we look at it, we'll be looking for um, one thing, which is the sort of chemical isotopes and trying to understand, you know, what type of star this came from, what does this imply about the conditions um, around that star. And the second thing is um, looking for any evidence of biological activity 
And if there isn't any biological activity, um, trying to understand what sort of level of uh, biological complexity, um, if at all, is implied by the uh, chemical compounds we see in the rock. We know there are amino acids um, that have been discovered uh, living on <laughs> space rocks, but you know, is there um, something more akin to RNA? And and uh, these sort of chemical and biological uh, questions will really allow us to um, gain a deeper understanding, even if we don't find any uh, extraterrestrial biology from these interstellar objects, it'll give us a much better sense of what the chances are and um, and what we can expect from the search for life. So this is about as much conjecture as it gets, but if we track down an interstellar object in our solar system, we find out that it has life on it and actually clearly detect it. What, what do you think that would mean for society and culture how would that change the way that we see ourselves on Earth? That's a great question. I think something like that would have really profound societal implications. And I, and I think this ties in more broadly with um, the search for life and, and what it means and, you know, starting to think about, you know, if we discover microbes elsewhere and if we discover um, intelligent life elsewhere, what is that... Um, tell us and you know what does that mean philosophically and i think you know specifically looking at panspermia and you know if someday in the future we do discover um, a microbe uh, an extraterrestrial microbe that has hitchhiked on a rock um, it is that would be sort of the most ultimate confirmation that you know our universe is really interconnected in a lot of deep ways that uh, we might not even appreciate but I you know I hope that um, one day you know I, I live to uh, discover or uh, to witness the discovery of you know the first biosignatures or maybe even uh, techno signatures um, and and that is certainly something that sort of gets me up in the morning thank you so much for talking to us about your research and uh yeah, let's hope we get a really, you know, convenient interstellar object in the solar system soon. I hope so. Thank you for having me, Becky. <laughs>